Every small town has its secrets, some darker than others. When 25-year-old Russell Bean went missing from Marlowe, New Hampshire in the fall of 1978, there were few who asked questions. There were no searches, no flyers, nothing to suggest he'd ever even been there. Time slowly moved forward, and for many, Russell Bean was forgotten. Not to his family, though. They never stopped believing that one day they would find him, likely the victim of a crime by an unknown perpetrator who used Russell's kindness and big heart against him. However, the more time passed, the less likely it appeared the answers would come. And then, everything changed. In the winter of 1988, ten long years after Russell vanished, a late-night confession blew open the case and revealed the horror of the truth. Investigators arrived at a quiet cabin along a secluded dirt road. Four long and difficult days later, 20 feet below the surface, Russell Bean was finally located. The home belonged to Robert Chambers, a longtime resident of Marlowe, part-time police chief, Russell's former best friend, and the man who had married his ex-wife. Quickly, the investigation would uncover accusations of abuse, violence, revenge, and betrayal, a bitter love triangle a decade old. Police would have to fight through 10 years of rumor and speculation to find the truth. Who was responsible for Russell's death, and who exactly had known where he was for all those years? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 164, The Murder of Russell Bean. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the murder of Russell Bean, a case with so many twists and turns it's difficult to know up from down. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. In the fall of 1978, 25-year-old Russell Bean mysteriously vanished. Ten years later, after a haunting confession, the investigation pivoted from a missing person to homicide, and at the center was a man Russell once called a friend. This is episode 164, The Murder of Russell Bean. The bitter chill of winter, while relaxing its grip throughout much of the country, refused to yield the northeast. Frigid winds swept in from the north, sailing over mountains and slicing down through the valleys. The lush green promise of spring was still somewhere beyond a horizon, now shivering beneath endless clumps of cloud hung like a drop ceiling, a blue-gray veil concealing the warmth of the sun. Heavy snowfall battered the higher elevations, Mountains capped in thick white blankets as a wall of steadily dropping flurry slowly poured down into the towns below, the gray mist of freezing fog billowing out like icy breaths from aching, chapped lips. The chilled waters of the Connecticut River flow south from the Canadian border to the Long Island Sound, winding their way along the invisible line that separates New Hampshire from Vermont. Just to the east, Tucked deep into the southwest of the state of New Hampshire is the quiet town of Marlowe, and quiet is how the residents prefer it remain. Once known as a lumber town, over the years, it slowly evolved into a quiet community of less than 700, the type of place where everyone knew each other, and as is often the case, there was little that went unnoticed, even if most people preferred to mind their own business, or at least wanted to appear as though they did. 
Marlowe had had a brush with infamy in the early 1980s, when Audrey Marie Hilly came to town in hopes of escaping her crimes. Dubbed a Black Widow, Hilly was indicted for the murder of her husband, when an exhumation found extremely high levels of arsenic in his system, the same poison which had put her daughter Carol in the hospital not long after she'd taken out a large life insurance policy. Hilly went on the run to Florida, using the alias Robbie Hannon. She married John Homan III before the couple moved to the secluded town of Marlowe. A year later, she'd fake her death, reappearing as her imaginary twin sister, Terry Martin, moving in with Homan before locals grew suspicious and Marie was arrested, confessing her true identity. Hilly had tried to conceal her secrets in the small town, but as it turned out, Marlowe had a dark secret of its own. On a blustery Wednesday night, the doors to the New Hampshire State Police barracks swung open with a whirl. A woman stepped inside, her eyes immediately moving toward the officer, standing behind a large counter. He looked up, watching as the woman moved towards him, noting a certain urgency in her strides as though she were trying to evade something or someone. Her face was ashen. She had the look of someone who was frightened, but resolved. I need to speak to someone about a murder. The words fell from her mouth like an anvil slamming the floor. Moments later, she was seated across from an investigator, steam rising from the coffee cup clutched between her chilled fingers as the cup warmed her palms. The shrill squeal of metal hissed out as a detective drew open his desk drawer, pulling out a large legal pad and thumping it down on the desktop. Pen in hand, he turned his sharp eyes towards the woman, who immediately began speaking. His hand moved quickly, blue ink sliding over yellow pages, spelling out the name Russell Bean. Ten years earlier, he'd mysteriously disappeared, and no one ever knew where he'd gone or why. Now it seemed he hadn't actually gone anywhere but had been in Marlowe for all these years, just waiting to be found. Looking towards the woman, the detective asked if she knew where Russell was, and she nodded. Next, he asked if she knew the identity of the killer. For what seemed like a lifetime, the silence hung thick and heavy in the air, until, in nearly a whisper, she choked out, It's my brother. Russell John Bean was born on Monday, November 3, 1952, in Rochester, New Hampshire, to parents John Amos Bean and Muriel Joy Russell. At the time of Russell's birth, he had two older brothers, Alan and Adrian, as well as an older sister, Doris. The youngest, Janet, would come along two years later, and the five siblings would form a tight unit. Russell would quickly become the center of adoration, as Doris later stated that among the five siblings, Russell was by far the most lovable. From a young age, he was noted as having a big heart, always wanting to make others feel better and never struggling to get his siblings to laugh. Growing up in rural New Hampshire in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of time dedicated to exploration and playing outdoors. Russell quickly fell in love with the natural wonders around him, and if he wasn't out playing in the woods somewhere, then he was either hunting or fishing. In school, he was a good student, though perhaps not the most dedicated to his studies. He enjoyed having a good time, and certainly earned a reputation as a jokester. Sadly, tragedy would strike the family when Russell was just 10 years old, as his father John passed away on July 9th at just the age of 52. It was a difficult time for the family, and for Muriel, who had to find a way to support and raise her children. Russell would go on to attend Spalding High School in Rochester, graduating in 1970. There isn't a great wealth of information available about Russell in the years following his graduation. He worked several different jobs during this time, with friends and family saying that he had a good work ethic and was often lauded by his bosses as being one of the hardest workers on site. Much of his work took place in different factories spread out through the area. In June of 1976, Russell married girlfriend Sylvia. 
The couple would go on to have a child together a year later, in October of 1977. At the time, Sylvia had two children from a previous marriage. They lived in an apartment in the small town of Marlboro, just a few miles southeast of the city of Keene. Russell would eventually meet and befriend Robert Chambers when the two worked together in a factory. They hit it off quickly and became close friends, with Russell and Sylvia frequently spending time with Robert and his wife Deborah. Friends would later describe Russell and Robert as drinking buddies, with Doris later telling reporters that they often played pool together and hung out at least once a week. Their friendship was tight, with multiple articles noting that Russell even helped Chambers build the cabin he lived in on Newell Pond Road. Sylvia would later tell the Keen Sentinel that the two spent so much time hanging out and partying together that she began to grow frustrated with the situation. In the summer of 1978, she confronted Russell, explaining that she was tired of him always going out with Robert, leaving her home to look after the kids, and according to her, Russell understood and agreed that he needed to put an end to that lifestyle. Unfortunately, Russell would mysteriously vanish that fall. It was the evening of Friday, September 15th, when Russell would leave the apartment never to return. From everything we know, the day had been without incident, and everything appeared to be normal. According to Sylvia, the last time she saw her husband was at approximately 6 p.m. She would later tell the Sentinel that Russell left the apartment that night in the company of his close friend, Robert Chambers. Russell didn't come home that night, and Sylvia, worried about her husband, managed to get in touch with Chambers. It was at this point, according to Sylvia, that Chambers broke the news to her. Russell was gone. He'd left town, and he wasn't planning on coming back. Sylvia has stated multiple times that Chambers told her Russell had told him he wanted to get away and he needed help. Chambers allegedly told Sylvia that he'd given Russell cash in exchange for his paycheck before driving him west to the Vermont state line, at which time Russell exited the vehicle and walked off into the unknown. To Sylvia, it made little sense. She'd had no indication that Russell was unhappy or planning to run off anywhere, and it was hard to believe he would just abandon his wife and children without so much as a heads up or explanation. For many, it's difficult to accept this explanation, and all these years later, there are still some who wonder what Sylvia may have known versus what she may have suspected. Not long after Russell's disappearance, the phone rang in the home of his mother, Muriel. When she answered, Sylvia was on the other end explaining that Russell was gone. According to the Boston Globe, at the time, Sylvia made the call to Muriel and reiterated what Chambers had told her, and it's noted that Chambers was apparently in the apartment with Sylvia when this call was made. Muriel quickly reached out to her children, telling them of the situation, which obviously raised a lot of concerns. Doris later explained that when she heard Russell was gone, the first thing she did was drive to Marlboro to speak with Sylvia, but the conversation didn't go as she'd imagined. Doris explained, quote, She seemed very nervous and wanted to go down to the laundromat to talk. It was there that I saw a man walk down the other side of the street. I knew he was going to be someone significant in this case. End quote. Doris believes the man she saw lingering in the area that night was Robert Chambers, but at the time, she couldn't say for sure. Over the course of the next few weeks, no one saw or heard from Russell. It was definitely strange, considering the 25-year-old had taken nothing with him other than the clothes on his back in the fall in the middle of nowhere. Russell was close with his family and kept in contact, and it was definitely suspicious that not only had he not told anyone of his alleged plans to run off, but no one heard from him in the days and weeks following his supposed escape to Vermont. Then, things became even stranger. Sylvia officially filed for divorce, accusing Russell of abandoning the family. That wasn't necessarily out of place, but court documents showed that by October 6th, just two weeks after Russell had last been seen, Sylvia now listed her address as being on Newell Pond Road in Marlow, 
at the home of Robert Chambers, whose wife Deborah had moved out three months earlier on July 4th. In March of 1979, Chambers filed for divorce from Deborah, arguing that she had left him and they had been separated for months. In April of 79, Sylvia's divorce was finalized with Russell having never shown up for a single court date. At the time, the divorce decree required him to make weekly support payments to his ex-wife, but those payments never came in. In fact, on April 17th, a warrant was issued for Russell's arrest due to his failure to make the court-ordered payments, but no one knew where he was. And within a year, the warrant was filed as inactive. Two months later in June, Robert Chambers finalized his divorce from Deborah, who had moved to the city of Keene along with her children. They signed divorce papers on June 20th, with Sylvia signing her name as a witness. Three months later in September, one year after anyone had seen or heard from Russell, Sylvia and Robert Chambers were married. Curiously, the same year Sylvia married Chambers, she secretly contacted the police to file a missing persons report. A six-month investigation took place, but it doesn't appear there was much hard detective work dedicated to trying to locate the missing man, and Sylvia later stated that the police had told her some people disappear because they want to be gone. At the time, Sylvia says she kept this report secret out of fear, later telling the Nashua Telegraph, quote, I thought if Bob had done something to him and he knew about a police search, he might do something bad to me, end quote. Three years later in 1982, Sylvia once again allowed some of her suspicion to leak out, this time in writing. She'd been sending letters to Russell's mother, and while the full content of those letters has never been discussed, Sergeant Clayton Young of the New Hampshire State Police did discuss one of the letters with the Boston Globe. Sergeant Young stated, quote, One letter Muriel remembered mentioned Robert Chambers. Sylvia told how she was afraid of him. She wanted to leave and go live with her sister, and that she was afraid of Robert, that he had done something bad to Russell. End quote. Reportedly, Muriel sent that letter to the Keene Police Department, and she never received another letter from her former daughter-in-law. Six more years would pass with no sign of Russell, and while his family hoped to locate him, investigators didn't seem interested in doing much to help. Life moved on for Sylvia, Chambers, and the town of Marlowe, but there were always rumors. Whispering voices told of a lurid tale about a love triangle, two close friends set against one another over one of their wives. Some people said Russell had fled town because Sylvia was going to leave him for Chambers. Others believe Russell had gone to confront Chambers and something bad had happened. As time passed, rumor became legend, legend became myth, and then, eventually, no one really talked about it at all. Sylvia and Chambers had a child together, and by the mid-80s, Robert began looking for a new career. For much of his life, he'd worked in logging alongside his father, but he was finding himself drawn towards police work. He began as a part-time officer in Marlowe and neighboring Hinsdale, working his way up. In 1985, he assumed the part-time role of police chief in Marlowe. Inside of the next three years, he would pull triple duty, working as part-time chief in Marlowe, nearby Gilsom, and he was attending the police academy while training as an officer in Winchester. Chambers developed a reputation for getting things done, though the manner in which he accomplished those tasks wasn't appreciated by all. At the time, for many of the towns in New Hampshire and much of New England, police chiefs weren't elected positions, but instead were appointed by the Board of Selectmen, essentially New England's version of a town council. While the selectmen seemed to appreciate Chambers' efforts, locals quietly talked about abusive and threatening behavior conducted by the chief, though no one wanted to sign their name to a complaint, out of fear both of his temper and the badge that allowed him to wield it as he saw fit. Tom Foote, an officer for the Marlowe Police, praised Chambers, saying, quote, I don't think I've ever worked for anyone who gave more effort and support to what had to be done, end quote. But opinions were divided, 
with Chambers' uncle, Harry Briggs, later telling the Nashua Telegraph, quote, Bob had his friends and made his enemies. This town is split with him, end quote. Chambers attended the academy during evenings, making a two-hour drive each way. By March of 88, he was preparing to graduate and take on a full-time position with the Winchester Police Department. Everything was looking up for Chambers, but it was all about to come crashing down as a long-kept secret would be revealed by a most unexpected source, Robert's own father, Clifton Chambers. At the time, Clifton was living in a trailer on Robert's property alongside his daughter, Melissa, and his granddaughter, Lori. Clifton's wife, Elizabeth, passed away in 1985, and over the course of the next three years, he would suffer a series of illnesses, from bleeding ulcers to kidney problems and painful arthritis. Perhaps at his core, however, what was truly haunting Clifton was a decade-old secret that was fighting to get out. In the early morning hours of Thursday, March 3rd, he finally relieved himself of that burden. According to his daughter, Melissa, Clifton awakened her and Lori at approximately 5.30 a.m. He seemed nervous, upset, like he wanted to get something off his mind. Melissa would later tell state police that Clifton started off saying, There is a dark secret about Robert. You have to promise me not to say anything until I've died. In an affidavit, she wrote, quote, My father stated that Robert came to him in the middle of the night, real upset, saying, I killed Russ. I need to hide the body. What do I do? Dad and Robert went and got Russ's body from where it was, and then took it to Robert's land and buried it with the backhoe behind the shed. End quote. Clifton alleged that Robert had told him he'd gotten into a fight with Russell, and during the struggle, Russell had fallen backwards and cracked his skull against a rock, dying almost immediately. Just five days later, on Tuesday, March 8th, Clifton collapsed in the men's room of the Hinsdale dog track. He was rushed to the hospital, but passed away the next day, Wednesday, March 9th, having suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. That same night, Melissa paid a visit to the New Hampshire State Police alongside her daughter, and her brother-in-law, Louis LaCourse. Russell's sister, Doris, later explained that she received a call from the New Hampshire State Police during this time, asking her what she knew about Robert Chambers. She explained, quote, When I heard what they were looking for, I immediately knew what had happened to him. Not how, but what. End quote. Less than 48 hours later, State police obtained multiple warrants to search Chambers' property based on those affidavits. On the morning of Friday, March 11th, the same day Chambers was set to graduate from the police academy, a convoy of police vehicles pulled onto the dirt of Newell Pond Road, bringing with them shovels, picks, and a trailer pulling a backhoe. Investigators from the Major Crimes Unit of the State Police the Cheshire County Sheriff's Department, and the Keene Police Department began digging in a spot approximately 75 feet from Chambers' cabin, in a space that had once been utilized as a pig pen. Over the long, cold weekend, police vehicles remained at the cabin 24 hours a day, both during the digging and to guard the location when the excavation was called off for the night. Piles of dirt climbing eight feet high surrounded a massive hole, illuminated by the glow of work lights hooked up to generators. It was bitterly cold, the ground hard as a rock, with snow falling throughout much of the dig. In a town like Marlow, news spreads quickly, and soon reporters were turning to the Attorney General's office for answers, but law enforcement remained tight-lipped. Gregory Swope, Senior Assistant Attorney General, told the Nashua Telegraph, quote, Allegations arose that a corpse was buried at the location approximately 10 years ago, end quote. At the time, Swope would not share the name of the alleged victim nor who the allegations had come from. Locals were surprised, with many noting that Chambers had been an upstanding citizen and his wife, Sylvia, was very involved in the local community as part of the Girl Scouts as well as the Cancer Society. 
After four long, hard, cold days of fighting through the mud and hard earth, police created a hole measuring 20 feet deep and 25 feet in diameter, and at the bottom, there were human remains. Due to the cold temperatures and the dampness of the area, the body had been somewhat preserved, with police recovering bone, tissue, and articles of clothing. It was the morning of Monday, March 14th, and at the same time investigators were removing the remains from the hole, Robert Chambers was across town attending his father's funeral. The remains discovered were transferred to the state medical examiner's office, where Dr. Roger Fossum began an autopsy and the difficult task of trying to identify the body. At the time, the attorney general's office stated that no charges were yet being filed as they first needed to confirm the victim's identity and then determine whether or not the cause of death could be proven to be homicide. On Tuesday, March 15th, Dental records were able to positively identify the victim as Russell John Bean. For 10 long years, he'd laid beneath the ground in the front yard of his former friend's home, a home he had helped build, a home where his ex-wife had lived since just a few weeks after he disappeared. At the time, neither Chambers nor Sylvia would offer comment to the press, but things had already been set in motion. The Winchester police suspended Chambers pending the outcome of the investigation, and he would go on to resign from his position as police chief. Sylvia resigned from her job as a bus driver and pulled the kids out of school. Chambers' ex-wife, Deborah, was hospitalized during the digging, though at the time, no one knew why. Whether or not charges would be filed was a question no one had the answers to at the time. Everything depended on the autopsy and what Dr. Fossum could determine. On Wednesday, March 16th, Dr. Fossum took Russell's body to Maine to consult with one of the region's leading forensic anthropologists. According to the Telegraph, for the first time in history, a CAT scan was utilized in a death investigation. Scanning Russell's remains and creating a 3D rendering, they were able to examine damage to his body from different angles, according to the Telegraph. In the end, the ruling was clear. Russell's cause of death was listed as traumatic injuries to the head and chest. Homicide. Jeffrey Howard, Deputy Attorney General, explained to the Boston Globe, quote, There is some structural bone fragmentation that I don't believe could have been caused by a fist. The medical examiner has to have concluded it was something in someone's hand. I really think he came to the conclusion that the man was struck with a blunt object, as opposed to striking a blunt object, end quote. It was determined that Russell had suffered several blows to the head between his eyes with a thin, long object such as a bar or rod. The story about falling backwards was not going to stand up against physical evidence now. On Friday, March 18th, Robert Chambers was represented by public defender Mark Sisti whose first act of business was to request access to the sealed warrants so that he might learn what led police to his client's front lawn. Sisti stated to the media, quote, My client had nothing to do with causing the death of Mr. Bean. A lot of reports have been generated through rumors and speculation, and we'd like to see exactly what's in there. I'd like to quell the rumors and speculation flying around, end quote. At the same time, The media was working hard to get the warrants unsealed, but the attorney general's office argued against it. A media circus was building in Marlowe, and by Friday, March 25th, the quiet town was flooded with reporters, news vans, and satellite arrays. A hearing held during the week saw a judge order that the documents must be released to the public, including the affidavits that were the foundation for the warrants. As it turned out, There was quite a bit more in there than just Clifton Chambers' supposed confession. Melissa and Lori's affidavit supported one another, with Lori confirming that she was present when Clifton revealed the secret early in the morning hours of March 3rd. In part, Lori's affidavit reads, quote, Grandpa said that Robert told him they were drinking at the mines. They got into a fight, Robert hit him, and Russ fell over backwards, causing his head to split open and it killed him instantly. He also said no one would expect anything because the garden was just freshly dug, end quote. 
Louis LaCourse, Chambers' brother-in-law, had no specific knowledge of Clifton's admission, though he did report an odd conversation he'd had with Robert following Russell's disappearance. LaCourse wrote that Chambers told him, quote, he hit him so hard no one would ever see him again. Robert Chambers told Russ to hit the road, and Russ did, end quote. Melissa revealed in her statement that the March 3rd confession was the second time her father had told her, noting that he told a similar story a year earlier on April 20th, 1987. According to Melissa, Clifton had kept the secret all those years to protect his wife, their mother. But now that she was gone, he could no longer keep the truth suppressed. One of the more shocking accusations in Melissa's statement was not about the murder but the relationship between Russell, Robert, Sylvia, and Deborah. She wrote, quote, The relationship between Robert, Russ, Sylvia, and Debbie was weird. It's called wife swapping. That was going on before Debbie ran off and Russ disappeared. I know Robert always beat Debbie. That was why she ran off. She couldn't take it any longer. End quote. Deborah had confirmed the abuse years earlier in 1982 when she'd sworn out a domestic violence complaint against Chambers, alleging that he had beaten her. When they divorced, Robert had maintained custody of one child, and according to court documents obtained by the Boston Globe, Deborah had accused him of, quote, using the child as a lever to get money and sex out of me, end quote. On Thursday, March 31st, Sylvia Chambers sat down for a five-hour interview with the New Hampshire State Police. During that interview, she denied any knowledge of Russell's death or the fact that he had been buried in what had become her front yard. Sylvia told investigators she suspected something might have happened between her former husband and her current husband, but she never knew for sure. She also denied Melissa's account of her relationship, saying she had never taken part in any so-called wife-swapping, later telling the Rutland Daily Herald that the accusations were twisted and disgusting. For his part, Robert spoke publicly to the press for the first and last time, saying only, quote, I did not kill Russ Bean, end quote. In early April, Sylvia moved back into the home with her children so they could go to school. Chambers was ordered to stay away from the property and his wife, who, upon discovery of Russell's body, had begun the process of filing for divorce. Two weeks later, on April 13th, the Keene Sentinel published Sylvia's first public interview, in which she was asked pointed questions about Russell, Robert, and what the hell was going on. Sylvia stated that it was necessity which had driven her to move in with Chambers, explaining, quote, It was the only route to go. I had no money. Bob had no mother for his kids. It seemed like the convenient thing to do. End quote. Sylvia stated that she never asked Chambers about Russell, saying she was afraid of him and was fearful of how he would react. She went on to claim that whenever she thought of Russell and felt depressed, Chambers would become manipulative, telling her that the night he drove Russell to the Vermont border, Russ had begged him to promise that he would take care of his wife and children. When directly asked about Russell, Sylvia stated, quote, I loved him, and I knew he loved me. I knew he would never walk away. I knew something bad must have happened to him, or he wouldn't be gone. I didn't know from one minute to the next what had happened. I didn't know if he wanted to be gone or that he had been hurt. I left notes all over the house begging him to stay if he did come back home. End quote. In the aftermath, Sylvia explained, her children didn't understand the accusations, and while she tried to tell them the rumors were all lies, they created a rift between the family. On Friday, April 15th, Robert Chambers turned himself in and was officially charged with second-degree homicide. Attorney General Stephen Merrill told reporters that additional evidence supported family members' affidavits contending that Chambers killed Russell during a fight utilizing a weapon, possibly a hatchet or an axe. It's believed that the fight may have taken place in the front yard, not far from where Russell was ultimately buried, although there is some contradiction, with mention of the fight taking place at the Old Mines, which was believed to be referencing an out-of-use quarry. 
A hearing was set to take place Wednesday, May 11th. Chambers took part in two court hearings, which resulted in bail being set at $200,000. Unable to make bail, Chambers was remanded to the Cheshire County Jail, where he'd be placed in protective custody due to his former employment as a police officer. Merrill stated that Chambers had been charged with second-degree murder because they had no evidence of premeditation for a first-degree murder charge. However, it was noted that should Chambers be found guilty, he could face a sentence of up to 30 years without parole. While additional charges related to tampering with a body could have been filed, Merrill announced he didn't foresee any additional charges, nor did he think anyone other than Chambers would be arrested. Sisti, Chambers' defense attorney, made it clear that he would be fighting to have all statements regarding Clifton Chambers thrown out, as they did not legally qualify as a dying declaration and therefore were hearsay. Attorney General Merrill, however, stated that the declaration was proven with the discovery of Russell's body, saying that they very much doubted they would have found Russell without that declaration. Merrill also felt, though, that they had enough evidence after interviewing 20 people that, even if the declaration were thrown out, they could still move forward with prosecution. Ultimately, it would be up to the judge to determine what information would or would not be allowed. On Saturday, April 23rd, a small group of friends and family attended a funeral for Russell, held at Pine Grove Cemetery. It was an emotional day, bringing about an end to the mystery of what had become of their brother, son, uncle, and cousin. Sylvia attended the funeral, becoming very emotional when speaking to the family. Confronting the reality that her missing husband had been buried just yards from her front door was a difficult task, to say the least. Following the funeral, Russell's older brother, Alan, spoke to the Brattleboro Reformer, saying, quote, It's good that we took care of our brother and buried him properly. My brother was not a piece of garbage to be thrown in the ground. He was a human being. End quote. On Monday, May 2nd, a new hearing was held regarding Chambers' bail, with his lawyer arguing that he had been a resident of Marlowe for 28 years and had neither the money nor the inclination to be a flight risk. The Attorney General's office argued, considering the heinous nature of the crime, that bail should not be adjusted. However, Judge Contis disagreed, eventually lowering Chambers' bail, though not by much. Bail was arraigned in such a way that Chambers would need to put up $75,000 in cash as well as $75,000 in property. At the time, Chambers sought to mortgage his home, but the judge blocked that action, noting that under New Hampshire law, both he and his wife had claim to the home regardless of whose name was on the title. Two days later, Attorney Sisti presented arguments to the judge that the statements of Melissa and Lori should be excluded from the grand jury hearings. In addition, Chambers' ex-wife Deborah swore out an affidavit, and Sisti argued the grand jury should not be allowed to hear that, arguing that Deborah had a history of mental health issues and her statements could not be relied upon. On Friday, May 6th, the grand jury convened and listened to testimony for three and a half hours. Witnesses included friends, family, and law enforcement. We don't know exactly what was and what was not deemed admissible due to the secretive nature of the grand jury proceedings, though we do know the outcome. On Friday afternoon, Robert Chambers walked out of the courthouse a free man after a 25-member jury refused to issue an indictment for second-degree murder. Walking down the steps through a stream of reporters, Chambers issued only one statement, saying, quote, I feel real fine, end quote. Apparently, the jury's decision not to indict Chambers was due to the reliability of statements made by witnesses regarding the crime itself. There were some contradictions between the affidavits and the evidence, and the jury didn't believe enough solid evidence existed to earn an indictment. As for the attorney general's office, they said the case was not over. Merrill said the investigation would continue, and one month later on June 9th, police arrived at the old quarry, less than a mile from Chambers' Newell Pond Road home. There, they hooked up pumping equipment and, over the weekend, 
removed more than 1 million gallons of water before getting down and searching through over two feet of sludge in search of the murder weapon. Reportedly, family members told police that right around the time of Russell's disappearance, an axe had disappeared from the chamber's home. Unfortunately, no weapon was recovered. According to the Berkshire Eagle, however, both Melissa and Sylvia told investigators that they had searched the wrong pond though investigators said it was unlikely they would conduct a second search. Lieutenant Martin Hian of the state police, when asked about the status of the case, replied, quote, It's pretty safe to say that we've pretty much exhausted the leads of which we are knowledgeable. At this point, we will evaluate what we've done and see if there are any stones left unturned. The case went quiet for several months until a shocking revelation hit the front page in October. On the 5th, the Keen Sentinel published an explosive interview with Chambers' ex-wife, Deborah. During this interview, Deborah stated that she had been present when Russell was killed. According to her, she and Chambers were separated at the time, and she'd come back to the house to try and reconcile. Not long after she arrived, Chambers and Russell showed up at the house together. Deborah claimed that when he saw her, Chambers became angered and started insulting her. At some point, she tripped, falling onto the front steps and Chambers approached, trying to kick her. At that point, Russell got between the two of them to break up the fight. Chambers allegedly then picked up a hatchet and struck Russell several times in the head and once in the chest. Deborah said that, as Russell lay dying, he asked her to take care of his children and to tell Sylvia that he loved her. Deborah stated that Russell died at approximately 7.30 p.m. on September 5, 1978, not far from where he was ultimately buried. When she heard the news the police were digging up Chambers' yard, she was hospitalized after attempting to take her own life. She explained, quote, I was so depressed, I planned on dying. I loved him and wanted to be with him, end quote. This kicked off another massive media response with everyone wanting to get interviews with Chambers, though he denied them all and would communicate only through his lawyer. Deborah's account was disturbing and haunting, but there was also something wrong with it. Investigators knew things didn't add up. Chambers presumably knew the story was not entirely based on fact. However, it would ultimately be Deborah's son, Robert Chambers Jr., who would expose her in an extremely public fashion. Just days after the interview was published, Robert Chambers Jr. spoke to the media and stated, quote, My mother doesn't know how Russ Bean was killed because I was there when she first found out. End quote. Chambers Jr. went on to explain that a relative had come to the house around the time police were digging and explained the story Clifton had delivered. According to Chambers Jr., his mother had no knowledge of the murder prior to that discussion. Even if she may have suspected it, she was certainly not present for it. Two weeks later, on October 19th, Deborah sat down with state police and recanted her statement, saying she had made up the entire story about the hatchet and the murder. She later said that she had done so because of the abuse she had suffered while married to Chambers. She wanted to see him punished. She told the Telegraph, quote, I fantasized it was true that I was there, but I know I wasn't. It's a horrible thing to lie. Most of everything I've said is the truth, except that I wasn't there that day Russ died. I did not go back that day. End quote. Days later, a reporter ran into Chambers at a restaurant, and while he would not comment on his ex-wife, He did request that the reporter take a photo of him, which ran in multiple articles. In the photo, Chambers sat back in his seat at the counter, smirking. As for the investigation, it was stalled. While neither the Attorney General's office nor law enforcement would comment on Chambers' status as a suspect, Assistant Attorney General Kathleen McGuire told the media that the status of the case remained the same. When asked about Deborah's statement and her confession that it was a lie, McGuire replied that the state's case did not depend on Deborah's testimony. However, 
Without further developments, new witnesses, or new evidence, it was unlikely anyone would be charged again. The case was left open, but it was no longer actively being investigated. And so, after a decade of mystery, the truth of Russell's fate was known, but no one would be legally held accountable for his death nor concealing his body for that decade. For Russell's family, it was frustrating news. They wanted to see justice done for their brother. They wanted to see someone pay the price for what they were robbed of. In a heartbreaking interview with the Sentinel, Doris explained, quote, I knew there was nothing I could do. The only thing I could do for Russell now is help bring his killer to justice, which didn't happen. End quote. In the aftermath, Sylvia and Chambers divorced, and she moved to Keene, living with her sister for a period of time. Deborah, too, ended up in Keene, hoping to escape the ghosts of trauma and pain resurrected when Russell Bean was found. As for Chambers, his career in law enforcement was over, and he returned to logging, leaving Marlowe altogether. His violent and abusive behavior, once concealed inside of his own home, soon hit the headlines when in November, five months after the grand jury chose not to indict, he was arrested for punching a woman with whom he was living. He eventually pled guilty and received a slap on the wrist, a 60-day suspended sentence and a $100 fine with $50 suspended. Way to be tough on domestic violence, New Hampshire. By year's end, the news vans had disappeared, the media circus packed up its tent, and Marlowe went back to being the quiet, peaceful little town it had been before Russell Bean's body had been discovered. For the most part, everyone associated with the case fell out of the lens of the public, moving on with their lives and wishing to distance themselves. Russell's family tried through the 90s to raise awareness even offering $5,000 for anyone who could come forward with information. The common belief among the family and law enforcement was that there are people in Marlowe who know enough to see justice done, but they don't want to get involved. They don't want to speak up. They'd rather continue living in their happy, peaceful little town, even if that means a killer walks free. Justice can work slowly and in its own way. Nearly 40 years after the murder of Russell Bean, Robert Chambers would finally be revealed for the monster that he is. I do want to warn you, we're about to discuss issues relating to child abuse, domestic abuse, and sexual assault, which you may find disturbing. I will do my best to work off court documents, and I, of course, will avoid any graphic descriptions. In early 2016, the New Hampshire State Police began investigating allegations that Robert Chambers had sexually abused a minor for more than six years between 1994 and 2000. On July 26th, Robert Chambers, 64, was arrested without incident, according to the Keene Sentinel. Ultimately, he was indicted on seven counts of aggravated felonious sexual assault. According to the court documents, The victim, who had previously been sexually assaulted by her biological father, was targeted by Chambers when he began dating her mother. One court document reads, quote, The victim's mother testified that when she came home during the day, she occasionally found the defendant napping with the victim in bed with him. She testified that she was concerned and told the defendant that it didn't look right. She also stated that she asked the victim about it. Both told her that there was nothing going on. The victim's mother also testified that she was not surprised when she later learned of the allegations against the defendant. End quote. During the trial, the victim testified that Chambers had threatened her into silence, with one document reading, quote, He had said that he was a police chief and that it was my word against his, and people would believe him and not me. He also mentioned that they would take me out to go live in a group home, and he said little girls got raped with broomsticks there, and he said that I didn't want that to happen. The victim was then asked why she decided against telling her mother, and she responded, I was scared. Thereafter, 
She testified that she did not disclose the abuse at a later date because she was scared and ashamed. She further testified that she was, quote, terrified. I was so alone, and I didn't want to be taken out and away from my mom and my little brother, and I didn't think anyone would believe me. He had said multiple times that no one would believe me and that it was consensual. She testified that the assaults continued when she returned during summer break in college. Although she acknowledged that she was in counseling in college, she explained that she did not report the assaults at this time because she was afraid of the person that he is, afraid for her life. End quote. Chambers was ultimately found guilty on four counts, and on Friday, July 7, 2017, Cheshire County Superior Court Judge David Ruoff listened to arguments both from the defense and the prosecution prior to sentencing. A victim's advocate read out a statement written by the victim, which in part reads, quote, My request is that you think of me and think of my life when you sentence Mr. Chambers. Why should he be free when I never will be? It's hard for me to enjoy things because of the pain and trauma I experienced in my youth. End quote. Prosecutors requested that Chambers be sentenced to a minimum of 25 years, while the defense argued that, for a man of Chambers' age, that was condemning him to spend the rest of his life in prison. Judge Ruoff issued the maximum sentence, giving Chambers a sentence of 10 to 20 years for two of the counts and 10 to 20 years for the other. Judge Ruoff explained, quote, The victim suffered with this for 25 years. I just couldn't go with a sentence that's any less than the one I'm going to impose. End quote. Chambers filed an appeal, and in 2019, his appeal went all the way to the New Hampshire Supreme Court. One document explains, quote, Following a jury trial, the defendant was convicted and filed this appeal. He first argues that evidence of the victim's earlier report that she had been sexually abused by her biological father and her resultant receipt of counseling was relevant for two reasons. One, because it would undermine her assertion that she did not disclose the defendant's assaults because she did not expect to be believed. And two, because it would discredit her mother's expected testimony that she witnessed any signs of sexual misconduct. End quote. The court was not having any of that, though, and quickly dismissed these arguments showing that the abuse the victim suffered from her father was vastly different from the assault she was subjected to by Chambers, and that he and his attorneys had the ability to cross-examine the witness during the trial to target these areas, but the jury had not been moved by those attempts. The defense also argued that a phone call recorded between the victim and Chambers should not have been allowed into evidence for the trial. Court documents explain, quote, Here, the state notes that when the victim attempted to address the sexual assaults with the defendant during the first call, he ended that call because he had to go to the bathroom. Thus, the state argues, it was not clear from that conversation that there was no reason to believe that a second call would produce evidence of a crime. We agree. Given the victim's allegations against the defendant and the manner in which the first call ended, we conclude that there existed reasonable suspicion that evidence of criminal conduct would be derived from the second phone call, end quote. Ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled that the original trial was conducted properly, Chambers was at no time subject to undue process, and the trial court's ruling stands and is sustainable. Chambers' appeal was rejected, and for the past four years, he has languished in prison. One can't help but feel great pains for the victim, who may not have been subjected to this atrocious monster had he been indicted all those years ago in 1988, had the evidence been enough to sway the grand jury. You can't go back in time, you can't change the past, and while Chambers is finally where he belongs, it is truly tragic and heartbreaking that an innocent child of seven years old had to be subjected to his assaults for years too afraid of his revenge to speak out. There's not a person alive who knew Russell John Bean who doesn't speak about how good of a man he was and how big of a heart he had. At just 25 years old, he mysteriously vanished, leaving his loved ones to wonder what had become of him. 
His wife married the man many believe was responsible for his death. The family he should have been raising grew up playing on the very grass beneath which he was concealed. It took ten long years for the truth to come to the surface, and in the end, Chambers walked away, free to damage more lives, as he obviously did. But it's not too late to make things right. Assistant Attorney General William J. Agati told the Sentinel in 2016, quote, We're trying to get anything and everything we can find. We do believe that the witnesses that will be most helpful to us are still living right there in Cheshire County. End quote. Those who know the truth and continue to remain silent are no longer just protecting a former member of their community, someone they once called a friend, but also a horrible disgrace of a monster who threatens and sexually abuses children. Is that really who you want to stand by? Russell John Bean deserves justice, and more so than that, his family deserves justice in his stead. How long have they had to watch the man they believe stole Russell away from them, walking free, wreaking havoc in his wake? Russell's brother Adrian passed away in 1994, and his mother Muriel in 2007 at the age of 86. They never got to see anyone pay for what they did to their son and their brother. All these years later, so many questions still remain. Russell is laid in the same cemetery as his family. A stone with his name marks the spot. Yes, it's better to lay him to rest than to wonder what became of him. But there's still work to be done, and his family will not forget. As his sister Doris told the Sentinel just a few years ago, quote, If the truth isn't uncovered in this life, it will be in the next. We prefer it be sooner rather than later, though. We're willing to do what we have to do to bring justice. It's never been done. We'll do whatever we have to do for Russell. What's there to say? In most cases, we're left with a big mystery and few clues. In some, we have an idea of what might have gone on, who might be responsible. Usually, we lack the evidence to prove it, and so it's all stuck in this limbo somewhere between knowing something and being able to prove something. In the case of Russell Bean, it seems pretty clear that everyone knows, but nobody can actually prove it. Ten years allowed a lot of evidence to be destroyed, and a lot of rumors to spin reality in such a way that proving a fact required dispelling a bunch of speculation first. This really isn't a case where I can say the investigation was done poorly or there wasn't enough effort put into it. I mean, yeah, the fact that he was originally reported missing back in 1979 and almost nothing was done isn't great and likely contributed to the mystery continuing for a decade. At the same time, we don't know exactly what went on there. Were the police told Russell ran off? We know how quickly some police can be to dismiss a case when there's even a hint that they might have gone off on their own accord. Were they given the story we all heard years later, that Russell got money from Chambers and hitched a ride to the Vermont border? I feel like that's not a story where it's difficult to poke holes in it. It sounds more like Russell was reported missing, police took the report, and gave it a sort of we'll-keep-an-eye-out-for-him treatment. According to Sylvia and investigators later, police spent approximately six months looking for Russell, but... Even the cops years later suggested that it wasn't much of an investigation. It's certainly frustrating. Imagine this happening now. Someone goes missing, their best friend claims to have dropped them off at the border of the next state with no explanation about what the hell is going on. Even without everything else we know, wouldn't you be a little suspicious? It's not like he took him to a bus station or left him somewhere like a hotel or a major city hub. Then the missing man's wife moves in with this guy? How many red flags do you need? I think it comes down to a couple of different things. Firstly, this was 1978 in a very small town, and I don't think police or anyone else was really all that concerned about a guy in his 20s disappearing. Then, the guy who was last seen with him alive, the guy who then married his wife, is a long-term resident of the town whose father had been living on the same plot of land for many years, and I don't think locals questioned it all that much. 
Yeah, there were rumors, but no one was coming forward with any legitimate information. It certainly doesn't seem like the phones were ringing off the hook with people wanting to tell what they knew. It very much seems like one of those cases where people just didn't want to get involved for one reason or another. Russell disappears. Two weeks later, Sylvia moves in with Chambers. Six months later, she's divorced, and six months after that, she marries Chambers. To say Sylvia came under a lot of suspicion at the time is to put things mildly. Everyone was trying to figure out what she knew and when she had known it. In all the time I spent researching this case, I found Sylvia to be one of the most confusing aspects. I think maybe the reason she's such a question mark is because she wasn't sure what to believe. It seems like initially she believed Chambers' story, but as time went on, she started to question things. She wrote to Russell's mother, filed a missing persons report with the police. Those do not appear to be the actions of someone who was involved or had prior knowledge, but maybe someone who was beginning to fill in the blanks. It's certainly not the first time we've seen something like this. Someone who's abusive, manipulative, and domineering swoops in like a savior to help out. Sure, Sylvia, you can come stay with me since you're struggling. We're good friends, and you know Russell specifically asked me to look after you and the kids. Then, once she's in the house, things start to change. The man reveals who he really is, and through threats and violence, he builds up such fear that she can't even broach the subject or ask the question. Abusive relationships can be incredibly difficult to escape from, especially when you're not sure where to go or what the reaction might be. I'll say this. I don't think Sylvia is or was a dumb person. Somewhere she knew something was wrong with the story. Things didn't add up. It was completely out of character for Russell to just run off. But I also think Chambers did a remarkable job of fostering fear and doubt in her. Who knows what lengths he went to to tear her down and distort her thought process, whether that was making up lies about Russell, maybe him not wanting her anymore, or meeting someone else. Then there were the children. Would he have gone far enough to threaten them, to use them as a tool to control her? Deborah would certainly argue that Chambers wasn't above using his own children as a weapon. The fact of the matter is, we're never going to fully know what exactly was going on there, what Sylvia truly thought versus what she suspected. In the end, I'm inclined to believe she was highly suspicious the more time passed, but she couldn't prove it, and she was afraid of Chambers, and it seemed unlikely she knew beforehand or was involved in any kind of plot. At one point, Sylvia acknowledged that before Russell disappeared, she'd asked him to stop hanging out with Chambers. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me that if she was involved in some way with some romance with Chambers or some plot to eliminate Russell, that she'd be trying to distance herself from Chambers before things went sideways. I think this is a pure example of the kind of abuse, control, and manipulation employed generally by sociopaths. Sylvia had nowhere to turn to, and he comes in like a hero, here to save the day, and by the time you realize it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, it's too late. Now, while I can't say for sure that Chambers is a sociopath, I'm not a licensed psychologist, nor have I had any one-on-one -on -one conversations with him, but given his reputation for being violent and using his position to do what he wanted, and obviously the heinous crimes he was later imprisoned for, if this guy isn't a sociopath, he sure as hell comes close. Maybe more like a malignant narcissist, but I digress. Knowing what he was capable of doing, knowing the things that he said to that poor child he abused for years, the way he threatened her, the way he controlled her, the accusations Deborah made about her nine years of abuse in hell being married to him, is it really that difficult to imagine he was doing something similar to Sylvia? Did she know what Chambers was going to do? I don't think so. Did she have a pretty good idea of what happened as time went by? I think there's no doubt of that. She said as much in letters to Muriel. Deborah's another victim in this terrible story. Subjected to years of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse at the hands of her husband, the father of her children, she later suffers the long-term psychological effects of being exposed to that kind of trauma on a daily basis. Throughout much of the 1980s, she was in and out of psychiatric care. She struggled with suicidal ideation, guilt, anger, hurt. So much more than we can possibly imagine. 
She became so desperate to see Chambers punished for what he had done to her, as well as Russell, that she was willing to go to prison for it. She lied to the grand jury. She lied to the police. She lied to newspapers. It wasn't until her son exposed the truth that she had to admit what she had done. Sadly, I believe Deborah wanted to see Chambers locked away, but in the end, her testimony only led to more confusion for the grand jury and investigators as a whole. I can't say I fully blame her. I want to see justice done. I want to see killers and abusers and monsters locked away for the rest of their lives. And I understand the desire to force the hand of justice. But it rarely works out when you do. I don't think anyone blames Deborah. If nothing else, I think they can only imagine what horrors she endured, which brought her to that place. Before moving on to Clifton's confession, I did want to take a moment to touch on one other aspect of this case. In her affidavit, Melissa said that Russell, Sylvia, Chambers, and Deborah were involved in spouse swapping. This was backed up by Chambers' brother-in-law, Louis LaCourse, who told investigators that Robert Chambers himself said they swapped wives. Only one person has ever directly addressed it. Sylvia outright denies the allegation, referring to it as twisted and disgusting. Deborah was never asked, Chambers never spoke, and Russell couldn't speak. I could see a situation like that leading to increased tensions between the four. I could see where rumors of a love triangle would come out. However, we have no real proof, and I don't know if it's not just spiteful rumor. In the end, I don't think it matters so much in the grand scheme of things. I don't wish to look at it from an angle of morality or whatever. They're four adults free to live as they choose, and frankly, what goes on behind closed doors isn't my business. In regard to Russell's death, however, yeah, I think it has implications. It could go towards creating a rift between Russell and Chambers. It could lead to jealousy, anger, and violence, especially once Deborah had left for good. She moved out on July 4th, 1978, and two months later, Russell disappeared. I don't think it would be difficult to imagine Chambers may have turned his focus to Sylvia, wanting to steal her away from Russell. I also don't think it's entirely out of the question that Russell may have told Chambers they were done and to stay the fuck away from his wife. Could that have led to Russell's demise? Even police at the time speaking under the cloak of anonymity told reporters they believed the fight which led to Russell's death began over a woman. I suppose the one quote which really makes me wonder is when Deborah stated that she loved Russell and wanted to be with him. Was that out of some romance or tryst? Or was that more about a woman who was abused, manipulated, and controlled by a violent and vengeful husband, finding support and concern in a man like Russell, known for his big heart and caring nature? We may never know, and frankly, I don't know that it matters. If you're a killer, you often don't need much of an excuse to do it. In the end, I think this case really came down to a few major pieces. Clifton's confession kicked off everything. According to Melissa and Lori, Chambers' father told them on the night Russell vanished he was awakened by his son. Chambers allegedly said that he'd killed Russell and needed to get rid of the body. Clifton, wanting to protect his son, comes up with the idea to bury him right there in the front yard where no one will think to look. After that, it became a matter of just staying silent. But apparently for Clifton, the guilt began eating away at him until he couldn't hold it down any longer. So he tells Melissa and Lori, he asks that they not tell anyone until after he's gone, and in a bizarre twist of fate or perhaps an eerie sense of foresight, Clifton dies less than a week later. The day of his funeral was the day police began digging up Chambers' front lawn. When someone makes a confession like that, it's pretty easy to brush it off or assume it's illegitimate, but when you go to that spot, dig the hole and find the body, that gives the statement a hell of a lot more credibility. Now police have the story, confessed to Melissa, written and sworn out by her, confirmed by Lori in her own affidavit. You add to that the brother-in-law statement that Chambers stated he'd hit Russell hard enough that no one would ever see him again. It all sounds very compelling, and I think it's somewhat difficult to argue your way out of your missing friend, your wife's ex-husband, being found buried in your front yard. So, how did the grand jury determine there wasn't enough evidence to indict? I think it came as the result of a couple of different things. There was no murder weapon for one, and even in cases today you'll find prosecutors who hesitate to go to trial without it. 
There was no direct explanation for what had caused the alleged fight between Russell and Chambers, and even in the affidavits, Clifton claimed that Chambers told him the death was accidental. They fought, he hit Russell, who then fell down, hit his head on a rock, and died. Well, that could surely happen, but the autopsy disagreed. Russell didn't die from falling. He died from multiple blows with a long, thin, flat object to the head and chest. That does not sound like an accident. But now you've got a problem. Your witness statements contradict the evidence. The damage to Russell doesn't fit with the story you're being told. Now, obviously, Chambers could have killed Russell and then lied, saying it had been an accident, but you have no way of knowing. You could be speaking about the difference between second-degree murder and manslaughter, intent versus negligence. I've often wondered, had Chambers been charged with manslaughter, would the jury have indicted? We don't know the answer to that question, but I think maybe it can be difficult to prove intent when you're looking at a crime from 10 years earlier where you really don't have a great wealth of solid evidence about what exactly went down. Contradictions in statements, physical evidence not lining up with the narrative, a lot of rumor and speculation, and character. We don't talk about it much on this show because often these cases don't see the inside of a courtroom, but character plays a role. The town was divided when it came to Chambers. Some people loved him, other people hated him. Some saw him as a good man and a dedicated cop while others viewed him as a bully with a badge. But it wasn't just his character under the microscope. Word spread pretty quickly that Melissa and her brother did not get along and hadn't gotten along for years. I'm sure some effort was put into trying to prove she'd have a reason to lie about her brother, especially since with their father dying, the likelihood of her continuing to be allowed to live on that land was questionable at best. Their own uncle said they never liked each other very much and things could get intense between them. Then there was the slew of people who testified in Chambers' favor, which included a number of police officers and local powers, people from the town council, the selectmen as it was. When you add in Deborah's story, I think things just become too confusing. There wasn't enough of a direct line between the accusation and the outcome. Yes, Russell's body was found buried in Chambers' front yard. But could you prove that he was the one who buried him? Not really. Could you prove he was the one who killed him? Not really. When you're arguing defense, it isn't necessarily about proving your client couldn't have done it. Sometimes it's about showing other people could have done it just as easily. Could Clifton have made up the story because he himself was the one that murdered Russell? Sure. He had access to the backhoe. He had access to the property. And if Chambers wasn't home and the lawn was freshly dug up for a garden, maybe no one would have noticed. Then there's other questions. Where exactly did the murder take place? At this quarry? On the front lawn? There's no evidence to fully answer that question outside of testimony based on what Clifton supposedly told his daughter. Is the murder weapon in a pond somewhere? And if it were, would it even be recoverable after 10 years in the muck and mud? And if it was, could you gather any solid physical evidence off of it? These are all important questions that don't really have answers. Now, mind you, I'm not defending the grand jury's choice not to indict. I'm saying, even though it seems really clear what happened here, it's like I said earlier, there's a big difference between what you know and what you can prove. And in a courtroom, all that matters is what you can prove. My logical mind believes the truth is fairly well known when it comes to the murder of Russell Bean. I doubt there's many people who lived through it that don't feel like they know exactly what must have gone on. At the time, Chambers had friends who were willing to stand up for him as a good man, good neighbor, and a good cop. I think given what's transpired in the years since, it's evidently clear that whatever Chambers is, it's certainly not anything resembling a good man. If people could have seen that back then, if they'd been willing to speak up in 1988, then maybe he never would have had the chance to do the horrible things he did to a little girl all those years later. Things may be delayed, it may take more time than was hoped for, but he isn't free anymore. That may be enough for some, but certainly not for all. Justice matters. Truth matters. I don't give a damn if Chambers is sentenced to spend a hundred years in prison. I want to see him answer for Russell's death. For 43 years, he's never spoken a word about the crime, never given an interview, never been asked the hard questions. Some might say, what does it matter? 
He's never getting out of prison. But it does matter. It matters because until the truth is spoken, until everything is laid out and understood, Russell Bean's case remains with the cold case unit and is listed as unsolved. His family has suffered over the past four decades. They deserve answers. They deserve the truth. They deserve to feel like their brother, their uncle, their son got the justice he deserves. Unfortunately, unless new evidence is found or someone with knowledge finally grows a spine and comes forward, the murder of Russell John Bean will remain open, unsolved, and growing cold. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Russell Bean, there's honestly not a lot of it available out there. However, the Nashua Telegraph, Keen Sentinel, and Boston Globe have done the most extensive coverage. If you have any information about the murder of Russell Bean, please contact the New Hampshire State Police Major Crime Unit at 603-271-2663. You can also visit their website at doj.nh.gov. You can also contact Connecticut Valley Crime Stoppers at 1-888-680-8477 or by visiting their website at ctvalleycrimestoppers.org. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at traceevpod. Message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Trace Evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Aurora Kay, Bacon Bits the Cat. Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dave Allen, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eric Sumter, Guillerme Pinto, Heather Louise, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kara Moreland, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakaisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levonen, Sarah Mascaratolo, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, Tracy Woods, and Walter Jansen. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. That's going to conclude this week's episode. If you haven't already, please consider rating the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Five stars would be greatly appreciated, but it's up to you. Share these episodes, spread the word, and maybe together we can help bring justice to those who have been deprived of it. Thank you all once again for listening, supporting the show, and for being the best listeners a podcaster could ask for. Thank you again for listening to this episode. And I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.